Hello and welcome to this podcast, My Stories of Chinese Porcelain. I am Tu Rei Ming, a craftsman and writer on Chinese porcelain based in Xinhuashen, China, known as the Porcelain Capital. I hope you're enjoying hearing my stories about porcelain. This time I will tell you the long-kept secret of how blue and white porcelain is made and later how and why it became the most popular of high-end luxuries in Europe of the 17th century. The Chinese pop singer Jie Zhu or Chao Jilin had a famous song called Blue and White Porcelain. In the song it hints at blue and white porcelain's color as light sky blue. As a porcelain nerd, I always want to correct that, since the colour he was referring to is more like celadon and not blue and white porcelain. It's an easy mistake to make as ordinary people have few chances to have a good look at ancient blue and white porcelain. Also, blue and white porcelain is easy to imagine, so no wonder people often get the wrong impression about ancient white and blue porcelain. Most people see only the modern, industrial, mass-produced blue and white porcelain products. Those products are different in terms of the colour, shape, texture and so forth from the ancient, handmade porcelains. In this episode I will talk about blue and white porcelain's significance in human history, why it was so sought after and famous, and how it was made originally. You will recall that I mentioned in my previous podcast the French king Louis XIV, the Sun King, who commissioned the building of the famous Palace of Versailles and who, between 1670 and 1672, also had built the Trianon Palace for his beloved Madame de Maintenon. The palace's façade used lots of blue and white tiles, making it look like a huge blue-white piece of porcelain. The insides of the palace are decorated with various porcelain products from China as well, so it was known to everyone as the Porcelain Palace. At the time, France was dominating the whole of Europe under the rule of the Sun King, and this was about the same period of the Chinese Qing dynasty's Emperor Kangxi era, 1654 to 1722. Unfortunately, by 1687, the fragile ceramic tiles had deteriorated to such a point that Louis XVI ordered the demolition of the pavilion and its replacement with one made of stronger materials. So, if we visit the palace today, we can no longer find the true essence of the porcelain palace name anymore. But this story does show us the French king's blue and white porcelain fever. Actually, the obsession towards blue and white porcelain was not only held by French royals, but also by all Europeans of the time. Historically, blue and white porcelain was, for centuries, the most expensive and popular of luxury items in Europe. The modern-day luxury brands of Chanel, Louis Vuitton and the rest are no match for blue and white porcelain in terms of its popularity in its day. When blue and white porcelain was very popular in the Western world centuries ago, how was it faring in China? Though in China it was not as obsessed about as it was in the Western world, blue and white porcelain was certainly beloved. From the emperor to the general public, all loved and enjoyed using blue and white porcelain products. Although in China there were lots of other porcelain varieties, like celadon and white ceramics, none of them were as popular as blue and white porcelain. At that time, blue and white porcelain not only represented luxury and fashion, but was also the most advanced black and secret technology. Technology that remained a mystery to Westerners for a long time. During the first hundred years after blue and white porcelain arrived in Europe, the Europeans could not figure out how porcelain was made at all. In the 17th century, the prominent German polymath and natural philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz was fascinated by all things Chinese. It was said he once thought that porcelain was formed by water pressure. At that time, it's fair to say that the porcelain-making process was seen as a mystery high technology. So, how was blue and white porcelain made then? In general, it involved four major steps. First is to make the body form, from clays. There are many ways of shaping the body of a plate or bowl. Circling on a wheel is one of the most important techniques. Lots of people have watched the 1990 Hollywood movie Ghost. 
In that movie, there's a famous scene where actress Demi Moore makes a ceramic body with a potter's wheel. That is the basic technology used from the beginning of porcelain making. The only difference is that in history, the machine was driven by hand and not an electric motor. Even today, lots of craftsmen are still using the manual potter's wheel and the same techniques to make handmade porcelain. If you haven't used a potter's wheel before, you might find it very difficult to create the perfect shape. But there is another easy way to make the porcelain body. Use your hands to mould it, just like kids play with clay. This technique is still widely used in making porcelain sculptures. Anyway, no matter which method you choose, you have to form the body of the porcelain product first before anything else can happen. After the clay body has dried comes the second step. The second step of making blue and white porcelain is to paint on the blue colour. The painting process is pretty much like doing traditional Chinese painting. You use a paintbrush to paint patterns on the clay body rather than onto paper. The dye used is mixed with powdered minerals. You might think the dye colour for blue and white porcelain would be blue. In fact, it's not. It's a dark grey colour, and you can dilute it with water to adjust the shade of the colour. After firing in a kiln, the dark grey material turns into a blue colour. I remember seeing a Chinese drama movie telling a story set in a ceramic workshop. In the movie, the paint colour was blue in the painting section of the blue and white porcelain making process. It always makes me laugh, since it was obviously made by someone who wasn't in the know. The painting stage has its own techniques, but it's largely very similar to traditional Chinese painting. When my friends visit me and want to learn how to make blue and white porcelain, I always let them try a few brushstrokes to make them feel good. Sometimes, even if you're not an artist, you can still produce some unexpectedly good effects. At one time, a naughty little boy painted all over a plate, but after the firing, the result was really fascinating. Step three is to put on the glaze. A ceramic glaze is an impervious layer or coating of a vitreous substance which is fused to the porcelain body after firing. Before firing, the glaze is a muddy liquid. The simplest way of putting on the glaze is just to immerse the painted body into the muddy glaze. After putting on the glaze comes the fourth and final step, firing. The making of blue and white porcelain needs a high temperature above 1300 degrees Celsius, and in ancient days, using wood fuels, it took three days and nights. Modern technology uses gas, and that, along with better insulation, has improved the efficiency. Today, firing can take only a few hours. In ancient times, firing the kiln was the most difficult part of making porcelain. They did not have any reliable technology to measure and control the temperature. All they had was experience. Imagine how hard it must have been to maintain the temperature at 1250 or 1300 degrees in the days before we had our modern machinery. After these four steps, you will get the finished blue and white porcelain product. The finish is shiny and transparent. The surface is smooth and glossy. Under the thin, transparent glaze, you can see the beautiful colored patterns on the white jade-like body. A masterpiece is born. This whole process and procedure was established at the very origin of porcelain and did not change for thousands of years. It seems a simple process, but to make a high quality piece of porcelain is far from simple. In the next episodes, I will talk about a few porcelains popular around the world before I then talk more about the porcelain making process. Thank you for tuning in, and I very much hope you will join me again next time. This has been a China Plus podcast. Original Chinese reading was by Sang Liang Chongdu, with English translation by Graham Stevens. If you like the show, please give us a rating and subscribe to us wherever you listen. If you've got any questions or feedback, 
please feel free to contact us via email at podcast at cri.com.cn or on Twitter at hashtag China Plus Pods.